actually David was says he said I was glad when they said unto me to let us go unto the house of the Lord you know we get excited for our football teams we get excited for the latest movie that comes out but for some reason on Sundays we, we don't get so excited but you know a lot of us we get to sleep in you know who in here who in here works in the morning like have to be at work say by 8 39 o'clock anybody okay good a couple of you all the rest of you guys you're in entrepreneurs and you know and, and you know uh, self wealthy individuals that's great that's wonderful and blessed very blessed very blessed and uh, you know some people might work the late shift or whatever but it's funny because you'll get up super early in the morning get ready get your coffee and all that because you got to be at work by a certain time well yeah because I'm getting paid I'm taking care of my bills well you know what God will pay you better than anyone else, any job ever could. You know, I mean, it's, his paycheck may not come on Friday, but when he comes, he pays well. And he always pays better than what you expected. Amen. But we don't do it for a reward. We don't do it for ourselves. We come here because we want to leave better than when we came in. And we know that that's a law of worship, but it's also a, a law of the kingdom. The kingdom of God, it says that, that what's going to happen to you when you give certain things, it's going to be given back unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and then running over, it's going to be given back unto you, right? And so um, I just want to break up some things uh, today because has anybody been to a football game and nobody there shouted or yelled? No. No. Never, but who in here, by a show of hands, and don't be rebellious, uh, be, be a participator, who in here, by a show of hands, have watched a football game on television or live in a person, and you've seen crowds jump up and down and shout? Pretty much everybody in here. Some of you guys are rebellious, and you're going to hell for that, but it's okay. I'm just kidding. Loosen up. Come on. Let's, let's break it up. Let's be a little bit more uh, relaxed, okay? Here's what I, I, I want you to get. Church, not church, but I would say the kingdom of God and receiving from what God has in his word for you is the best place and the most exciting thing that you could have in your life. So every day when you wake up, it's like uh, it's like Super Bowl Sunday. It's like uh, uh, the grand premiere of the latest movie that you've been waiting for. It's the most amazing thing, but you've got to lean into it with your life and with your faith with your expectation because it says that our expectation literally comes from him he's the one that puts that expectation in your heart so how many people do we have expecting this morning amen good 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 well i'm going to recap a little bit we've been talking that we're on uh, taking ground we've been talking about taking ground and hopefully you've been getting something out of it um i've seen through the word of god how joshua we we know i'm going to recap just for a second joshua was the type of leader that led the nation. God chose him to lead the nation into the promised land. And for the past 40 years, they were living in the place of wilderness. And the place of wilderness was a place of provision. Their daily needs were met and provided for, but they weren't living in the promise. And they got used to living in a place of uh, necessity or, or, or waiting for another miracle to show up and just getting by and waiting for another miracle to show up. And that's what we've done as believers. You know, we'll, we'll kind of maintain our lives and our relationship with God, and then it'll get to a point to where we're like, oh, my gosh, I need a miracle. Has anybody besides me been there before? Yes, we all have that need, and God is a miracle-working God. And he will do the impossible, but he wants you living from a place to where you don't need the miracle but you are the miracle to where now you're the place that's walking in such a place of healing that you just walk into a room and the Lord starts speaking to you and says, hey man, go lay hands on that person because it says in James that you lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover, right? Jesus said that. He goes, hey, here's what I'm going to, here's my last words for you guys. Hey, go out, preach the gospel to every creature and lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. Cast out demons. Remember, he says all those things. That's what we as believers are supposed to be doing. But a lot of times in, in, in the church, in these days, people are just consumers. 
Like, let's just consume. Let's just get a bunch of word, but let's don't really act on the word. Well, that's where the frustration comes in. God didn't call us to live in the wilderness and be spectators or just consumers. He wants us to be participators. He wants us to be the ones going out because we are his voice and his arm and his body in the earth. Right? And so we've been looking at that and we've seen there's a parallel between the, the book of Joshua and the book of Ephesians. And so in the book of Ephesians, it talks about your identity. That's one of the first things he talks about. And if you can know your identity, then nothing can move you. Nothing can shake you. Um, and so really, we're, we're going to be looking at stepping into what's already ours. Don't you like to find out things that are already yours? Like, you know, you, you, you have a phone or you have a new device or something like that, and then one of your kids or somebody grabs it and does, da, 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 da. you're like, oh, my gosh, I didn't even know it could do that. Yeah, that's how it's supposed to be with God. And that's how, so here's the thing. There's going to have to be a, a change in your life. Does anybody want growth in their life? We all should. We all should want some form of growth, whether it be, uh, you know, mentally or emotionally or relationally or just learning more, whatever it may be. But, but in order for there to be any type of growth in your life, there has to be change. Growth without change is literally impossible. It can't happen. It can't happen at all. Amen? So I'm going to recap. We're going to look at Ephesians real quick. Ephesians, and I'm going to look at verses 4 through 6 in chapter 1. <clears throat> and it says this. I'm going to start in verse 4. And it says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us. That'll mess a lot of people up right there, that predestined thing. Like, oh, man, I don't know, because he already knows, you know, my end from my beginning, and he knows who's going to make it and who's not, and so why even try? You know, that's a lie from the pit of hell. That is a lie from the pit of hell. But it says here, it says, having predestined us to adoption, Hey, Gracie or somebody, can you turn me up a little bit? Because it seems like I'm really fighting to, to speak here. I don't hear it very well. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You know his will for you is good. And he actually takes pleasure, according to the word, in the prosperity of his servants. That means you advancing. That means you living in health. That means you living a good life. Right? And it says here that, you know, we're called by adoption by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. And so we talked about being accepted, and the reason why we kind of started off with being accepted is because you can't get anything else if you don't realize your position in Christ. You're accepted. You can never be rejected. It doesn't matter what somebody said about you or how somebody treated you or whatever, you cannot be rejected if you realize God accepts you. Say, I'm accepted. So, so really, what this is saying here is it's solidifying your position. Everybody say position. See, it's solidifying your position in Christ. Because when you realize that your position can't be moved, then you won't be either. Amen? Amen. You know what? Let's pray real quick. I just feel like we need to pray. Father, we just come before you this morning, and we thank you for your word. It's your word that does the work. It's your word that carries the anointing, and it's your word that has the power. And we thank you that you said that you hold your word even above your name. And so, Father, we thank you that this word, this logos, is becoming rhema. It's becoming revelation. It's becoming uh, illumination. It's becoming impartation in our lives. So right now, we open our eyes to see your word, our ears to hear it like we've never heard it before, and our hearts to receive it as final authority. And so we remove all old mindsets, all old religious tradition or whatever. We get it out of the way right now, and we thank you 
Holy Spirit for speaking to our hearts and our minds and bring transformation into our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. So, so we know, according to the past couple of weeks, everything belongs to you, right? It's already yours. You're just walking in it. And we also learned last week that we're on assignment. Had someone come up to me later on and said, man, Pastor, you're like punching me in the gut, kicking me when I was down, all this stuff. And I didn't ever want to hear that I was on assignment at my job. But here's the thing. If we realize that we're on assignment, it, tra it changes how we respond. When you realize you've been given an assignment and you're not going to make it to the next assignment until you pass that assignment. We've all had assignments in school, and if we don't do the assignment, what do we get? A failing grade. The cool thing with God, though, is that you don't fail. You just get to keep taking that assignment again until you pass it. God doesn't have any Fs. He just has Rs for repeat. <laughs> you just keep repeating. And a lot of times we get frustrated because we keep repeating the same old thing, but we don't want to change. So he's wanting us to change. And so uh, here's where the change, I believe, is going to happen today. We're going to uh, start to, you know, really unwrap these scriptures we've been reading. And we're going to look at the word chosen. Because you and I are chosen by God for such a time as this. And we've heard that before. There's been a lot of things, you know, we talk about the book of Esther. And maybe you recall for such a time as this. Well, every single one of us on this planet is called and chosen for such a time as this and if you really get what he's saying it will change your perspective it will change how you see things it will change how you respond to people that's good that's really good because a lot of times we don't respond the way that we want to be responded to we like to respond and then we're like well why are you being so mean to me like, oh, well, maybe you're the one that was the way you mean first, you know? Or shut me down because I'm preaching good. But see, here's the thing. We're chosen. Everybody say, I'm chosen. Say it again. Think about this for a second. Close your eyes for a second. Everybody close your eyes. Now think about this. Say, I'm chosen. He chose you. He handpicked you. Out of everyone. This isn't like... Uh, when you're out there in, in grade school and it's basketball and, and you're the last pick because you suck, that's not it. This is the one that like, no, you're perfect for this position. You're handcrafted, handmade. I'm picking you first. You're the first round draft pick. You know, they just had the NFL um, you know, draft day or whatever and there was a big, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe the guy didn't make it in the first round. It was just a big surprise to everybody, and I really didn't even know or care. But everybody makes this big, big to-do about someone that can throw a, a, a pig skin, a piece of leather full of air, down the field and do all these funny things, and he's the first pick of all these people that want him. Well, let me tell you something. You've got something even better than that. God, before he even formed this world, had you in mind and fashioned and planned and prepared for you to be chosen for right now. That's exciting. He, he could have put you back there uh, with Moses. And you could have been like, ooh, check out this miracle. There's a fire uh, at night. It keeps us warm. It's amazing. It keeps all the mosquitoes away. It's great. And then in the daytime, there's this cloud, and it kind of rests, and we kind of follow it. It's really neat. It's amazing. But there's no anointing for your life. And then, you know, I, I used to think about this. I don't know if anyone else has, but I used to really consider this stuff. And, man, how, what, what's it going to be like when we go to heaven? Has anybody ever thought about that before? What's it going to be like when you go to heaven? Like, am I just going to cry for eternity? Like, this is amazing. I made it. I can't believe it. No, I'm not. I mean, not, I'm, I'm going to be thankful. But And there's things like, man, I want to talk to uh, David, or I want to talk to Samson. Say, man, why'd you let her cut your hair? Or, you know, or, you know, or, you know, you, know, you just you, you think about all the people that you've heard about in the Bible, or, or Absalom with his long hair, and he right, got caught up in a tree, and then they end up killing him, or, you know, just crazy stuff. Like, 
you know, that on, on the TV just a while back, they said Jerry Springer died. I'm like, man, the Bible's way crazier than Jerry Springer. Like, there's some stories in there. Like, what the heck? And so you want to go up to heaven and you want to talk to these people and find out what they're going on. And, and really, I used to think about it and go, like, man, how cool is it going to be? Like, Moses, what was it like when you threw your rod down and it turned into a snake? You know, or what was it like when you held your arm out and, and the, the Red Sea began to part? Or when you held your arms up and the, 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 the battle was winning as long as you could do this? Or when you struck the rock? Or, you know, all of these things are... Hey, hey, what was it like, Gideon, when you, when you went out and, you know, and you laid the fleece on the ground and, you know, think about all that stuff. But really, they're in heaven right now, says, according to Hebrews, cheering us on. They're looking over like it's the first round's draft day, and they're waiting to see who the pick is and what they're going to do. And they're actually looking over, waiting for us to come up there I can tell you right now, with all certainty, with all confidence, David is probably waiting at the pearly gates, if there are any. I mean, there are, but he's probably waiting on you and me to get up there so then he can ask us the question, what was it like to have the anointing without measure inside you? Come on, I know you're just thinking about it, but think about it. all that David did when the anointing came upon him. <laughs> uh, kill Goliath, all of these things. What about Samson when the anointing came on him, picks up the jawbone of an ass and kills thousands of people? You know, he could, all these things when the anointing would come upon him. He's waiting to hear from us what it was like to have the anointing inside of us and upon us see we're walking around with this dynamo this this superpower yet we're living these low level lives like well I hope God does something he's waiting on you he's waiting on you to step into what he chose you for so we're going to break down this word for a second listen to this because see, we don't, we don't really understand the word chosen. Like we literally think it's like Red Rover or like we're playing a pickup game of basketball and the person who's the worst player gets picked last, right? Like, oh, I don't want them on my team. You know, I want just somebody else. No, Here, here's one thing. The word chosen means something completely different. You know, when we say the word love, we think about that. We don't really fully understand that. Like, oh, I, I love my wife and I sure love um, espressos. And cappuccinos from Nordagios. Or, I love my dog. Right? Or, oh, I love it. When I love snickerdoodle cookies. No, no, no. See, that, that, that doesn't, it doesn't mean the same thing. It doesn't carry the same weight. There's four different words for the word love in the Greek language. There's agape. There's phileo. There's storge. There's eros. There's all these types of love, and each one means something different. And literally, you know, the time when, when Jesus was asking Peter after he had ran off and denied him three times, they say that, you know, the sermon I've heard before is that he, he asked him three times to restore those three times that he denied him, and I think that's true. But more importantly, when you look at it again in the Greek, every time Jesus asked Peter, do you love me, he was saying, Peter, do you agape? Do you love me unconditionally to where you're not going to run? It's not going to be based on how you feel or, or, or based on the situation. Do you love me? And, and every time Peter responded, he would respond, uh, so, so Jesus says, Peter, do you, love, do you agape me? And Peter says, oh, yes, Lord, I phileo you. And we do that so many times in our lives. Like, right? yes, yes, Lord, you love me unconditionally, but I want to put some conditions, some clauses in my love for you. And finally, by the time Peter got to the third time, he finally he says, yes, Lord, I agape you. I love you unconditionally. I will do whatever you have for me to do. And so this word chosen, it means something completely different than what we think. And so the Hebrew word, we're going to look at Hebrew first, but then we're going to look into the Greek or the context that it means in the scripture. The Hebrew word is beher. Everybody say beher. So here's what it means. The word 
in Hebrew is beher, and it means to appoint. Now, when you're appointed something, it's not like an appointment, like, oh, we got to go get my oil changed at 11 o'clock tomorrow or something like that. It's not an appointment. It means to be given specific abilities, duties, responsibilities, or powers. That's what appoint means, okay? And then it says, here's another uh, definition of the word beher, to choose out. We know that. Selected. But here's what it also means. Excellent. To be chosen by God, it means he views you as excellent. Say, I'm excellent. See, sometimes we, we some of y'all didn't say that because you know you're not excellent because you know you. But God says, no, 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 I don't look at that. I look at the part that I made of you that is excellent. And so what we're not doing is we're, we're, we're living on our own mindset, our own understanding versus living up to what the word of God says of who we are. Okay. Now, here's another thing about the word beher. It means to require. When you're chosen, there's things that are required of you. Okay? Now, let, let me give you another scripture. It's not going to be on the screen, but I want to read it to you. It's in Isaiah 41, verses 8 through 10. I'm reading out of the New Living. And it says, but as for you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, I was talking to the same person, but, you know, Israel was his redemptive name, and Jacob was his, his given name, which meant swindler or deceiver. And he goes, hey, but as for you, Israel, my servant Jacob, so no matter uh, if it's before Christ or after Christ, he goes, you're my chosen one. God called you out. And so it says, my chosen one descended from Abraham, my friend. I've called you back from the ends of the earth, saying, you're my servant, for I have chosen you and I will not throw you away. I will not reject you. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. And this is for somebody. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. See, it's not yours, it's his. Now, why is he doing that? Why are we reading this? Because if he chose Jacob, whose known name is swindler, deceiver, he also chose you. Say, he chose me. So tell your neighbor, he chose me. Now tell your other neighbor, he chose you too. Okay? So I love the common English uh, Bible. It says that I didn't reject you. Remember we were talking about accepted? He's like, I chose you, which means I didn't reject you. You're accepted. And he says he's going to strengthen you. And so... One of the things in the Hebrew, the why I wanted to bring that up first, is Jewish people knew something about being chosen. Remember, they're the chosen nation of God, the, the called out, the separated ones for God. But here's the thing they knew. They knew that it was a responsibility not to be greater than or we're better than you, and so you guys don't deserve to be around here. And that's what the devil does. He takes something that God has said and twists it and perverts it. Look at what the Nazis did, the Jerry's, the Germans. They took what something God had said about a chosen generation and flipped it and says, you know what, we're going to get rid of them because we're the chosen race. See, it didn't mean superior. It literally means the Jewish understanding or Hebraic understanding of the word chosen where it says responsible is they knew that they were responsible to carry the blessing to help other people. Think about that. Your responsibility, if you're chosen by God, which we all are, is to receive the blessing so you can be a blessing and help someone else. That's awesome. That is awesome. They understood their responsibility was to fulfill that purpose of helping other people. That's what you and I, our responsibility are, is. Sorry. <laughs> so, so check this up. The Greek means this. Eklegomai. Now the word ek it means out from, to pull out from oneself or from something, to pull out from. And the word lego is the uh, verb form of the word logos, which means word. And so it means to pull out from the word. Okay, eklegomai. 
And so literally it means, here, here's what ek means, out or from, and lego means to speak, to affirm over, or to call by name. Did you know God just said that he affirmed you based on what we read in Ephesians? You're affirmed. Say, I'm affirmed. Come on, somebody. You're chosen. You're called by name. He called you by name. This is what the word chosen means. This is what he's saying to you. He's not saying for just preachers. He's not saying for apostles, prophets, evangelists. No, he says you. You are chosen. Say, I'm chosen. So this word that we get, uh, eklegomai, we're going to look at it a little bit closer because I want you to see something very specific. Uh, turn with me to John 1. We're going to look at this. Because we know that this word lego is the, from the word logos, right? Which means word. So look at this. This is John 1, one of the Gospels. In the beginning was the word, which is logos. We could say that, right? In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, Elohim, Yahweh, and the Logos was God. He was in the beginning with God. And by the way, did you notice this isn't he? Didn't say them, they. Didn't say he, she, the, the, that. No, it, it was a he. It's a he. Okay? So he was in the beginning with God. So the word was God, and it goes on to say, then the word became flesh, right? Now I'm going to read another scripture for you. First uh, John, turn with me to First John chapter 5. And it says this, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. We're talking about Jesus, right? Thank you, thank you. Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, and we automatically want to say the Son, but it says the Word. Look at that. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. So God, the Father, God, the Word, or the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. So it tells us that Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And it says that the Word was what? Made flesh. So literally when we read and see this word that we're chosen, it's literally meaning that God pulled you out from himself and then placed you here in the earth. That's huge, guys. That's huge. Now, if any of you uh, have children or are a child uh, or, or, or have parents, which you all have had parents, um, there's something significant about that. Like, I, I see my kids, I see my daughters, and, and I want them to succeed. I want them to be... a Bless, and I want them to be a blessing because they're an extension of me. And so whenever my kids go out and they do something or whatever, if they do something, uh, whether it be positive or whether it be negative, it's a reflection of me. Right? And just like when you, if you're employed by uh, uh, whoever your employer may be, when you go out and you're driving, say, their company vehicle, anything you do in that company vehicle is what? A representation of and an extension of that company. And so literally, when God says, I chose you, he says, I drew you out from myself because now you are my extension in the earth. It goes on to say, you are his voice in the earth. And so really, you are a rhema of the word in the earth. Because is, isn't logos, what did it say the logos was the word? So we know there's a logos, and rhema is a spoken word. It's a revelatory word of the word logos that's for that season and time. So you literally are drawn out of the logos. You are the rhema in the world for this time. You are a specific spoken word that God wants to get out into the earth for this time. 
Come on, somebody. That should change the way you respond. That should change the way you think. And, and, and it literally, it says, Old Testament talks about you giving praise to God. New Testament, especially in Ephesians, talks about you being a praise unto God. You are supposed to be a praise unto God. Not just to come in here and sometimes, you know, some people won't even, oh, praise the Lord, raise their hands, do whatever. They won't even do that. But he's not even asking you to say or do something. He's telling you to be something. Be who you already are created to be. Like you are the rhema before the foundations of the world were ever formed. He literally says, okay, before I even created dust, before I created the cosmos, before I created any of this stuff, I already had you in mind for this time. And, and, and so there's literally a mind shift that has to happen for us. And the reason why nobody's excited and jumping up and down right now is because your mind's trying to catch up to what the Word of God already says about you. My mind's still catching up. I'm still catching up, and I'm like super jacked up excited right now. And I haven't even had a Red Bull. I drink coffee and go to sleep, so guys, this is not caffeine. This is me excited about what this word says about you and me. Not about a, a, a five-fold ministry gift. I'm talking about, he says, no, you're chosen. You're my voice. You're my extension in the earth for right now. So, so, so check this out. If he said it, yet it isn't happening, then our mind's the issue. Your mind is the, the, the blockage or the... the um, I don't know, the, 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 the bug that needs fixing for your app in your life, right? Does anybody have a smart TV? A couple of you do? Okay. Smart TV is for the people that didn't raise their hand. Do you guys anybody know what a smart TV is? Show me your hand if you know what a smart TV is. Some of you do, some of you don't. Okay. For the ones that don't know what a smart TV, let me tell you this. A smart TV is kind of like a phone. It has apps that you can put on it, and it streams wirelessly or plugged in internet connection to where you can receive certain programs that are telling you their vision. Some of these smart TVs are kind of dumb. They're dumb TVs. But really, what are they doing? They're programs... What is it? Programming your mind. It's programming the way you think, the way you hear, and the way you respond or don't respond. And so the, the shift has to come here from our mind. Our mind has to take the, the shift because, see, your position never changes. If you ask Jesus into your heart, your position is you are a child of God. You are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Now that messes with some religious people, and I was one of the ones that it messed with because here's what I didn't realize. I got kind of caught up in the word destined. Has anybody been caught up in that word destined? Predestined? Like, hey, I don't even really need to serve God because he's already got it planned, you know, and, you know, maybe I'm going to make it, maybe I'm not going to do what I want to do and we'll see what happens when we get up there because it's already predestined well that is the wrong that's an American understanding that is so wrong it's not even funny because literally pre means beforehand correct destined is the word destiny so did you know you have a destiny and whenever you hear the word destiny destiny is good okay so you have a destiny that's prepared beforehand that's good for you, okay? So you're predestined. Now, here's the thing. My daughter and both daughters, uh, they're predestined. Their destiny is provided by my wife and I for them to go to college. Like, we're going to provide for them to go to college. We're going to get assistance or whatever from the Indians or whomever, but we are going to provide... <laughs> For their education. So my destiny as a parent for my child is to get a college degree or trade school certificate, whatever it may be. That is our destiny for them. So is their destiny already prepared? Yes, by us. Whether they fulfill 
that destiny or not is completely and entirely up to them. That's the same thing with God. God has a destiny for your life that's planned, prepared, and actually better than your carnal, natural mind can even fathom. Like, whatever you think your mind is, it could be like, oh, it'd be so great to, like, uh, be a bazillionaire and have 14 houses and to make it uh, passive income for me, and I'm just going out and I'm laying hands on the sick, and when I walk into Walmart, the whole pharmacy area just, they fall out under the anointing. Well, God says, oh, yeah, you think that's it? Here, hold my holy water. And, and so then he really shows you what he can do way better, exceedingly abundantly above. He can do greater than that. So what we have to do is we have to get our mind brought up to what this already says about us. So see, if, if, if say, say my, my older daughter, she's going to be a junior at Oklahoma State. I don't know how that happened. We got married when we were 12, my wife and I. I'm just kidding. I don't see, it's like, how in the world is she going to be a junior? <laughs> it's crazy. But with that... See, if she chose not to do her homework, if she chose not to um, hang around the right people and sort of just hang on people that wasted time, didn't do anything, would it be my fault that she didn't get her degree? Can't hear you. No, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. But why is it we try to blame God for things not happening in our lives? We're the ones that are responsible. We're the ones that are like, okay, um, am I thinking according to what the Word of God says? Do I know that I'm already healed? Do I know I'm already provided for? Do I know that I'm already blessed? Okay, well, are my actions and my words, my, my logos, are they aligning with this logo? Am I getting the rhema, the spoken word about my situation? So see, if you can get your mind up to speed with what the Word of God says, you're unstoppable. You're literally unstoppable. You might have a few speed bumps along the way, and those speed bumps may have felt like a wall just a few years ago, but now because you've got your mind aligned with this and up to speed with this, now nothing's impossible. Come on, somebody. Because here's what's happening we're, I'm trying to get your minds caught up to who you already are. You already are blessed. You already are healed. You already are whole. You already are provided for. But if you don't understand that, then it's not going to work for you. And it's not going to be God's fault. Has anybody watched Jerry Springer before? Okay, none of y'all want to raise your holy hand. Some of you do good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I've watched it. I've watched it. I think it's pretty cool. It's crazy. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And don't you watch it, and you're like, oh, you kind of, like, judge them a little bit? Like, what in the world were you thinking? You are crazy. Oh, you're about to get hit. They're going to hit you. When you find the results, you're going to get hit. You know, right? Why is it we can watch that and go, oh, man, they just made poor choices? They made poor choices all along the way. It's not a surprise. But then we treat God completely different. And he's watching us like we're Jerry Springer show. He's like, hey, guys, <laughs> make some changes. Start to change the way you're thinking. Align it with this. Start to speak the right way. You can't cast calories out of a croissant. But you can eat a portion of it and be okay. <laughs> See, here's the cool thing is God created everything. He's already created everything under the sun. And he, he, he like, literally, um, I was talking with someone earlier today, and we are talking about, you know, defense type of things and situations, situational awareness. I'm big on that. I'm always, like, um, trying to be aware of the situation. Like, um, we were out doing some things yesterday, and, and we were in this area, and I was watching these people, and, and I was saying, okay, we need to move. We need to keep moving. Don't, don't just hang out here. Keep moving. And, and some people within my group uh, were not being situationally aware. They're like, oh, look, pinion mud. It smells so good. It's, uh, I'm like, get out of here. Keep moving. You know, because I didn't want anything to escalate. 
and me have to do something I didn't want to do the day before church. Like take people out. <laughs> but but the thing is, is is so we were talking about situational awareness and, and so I was saying, well, here's what I've taught my kids to do. Da, 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 and they go, well, here's what I've taught my kid to do. <laughs> shock them. <laughs> Use the shocker on them. Just rah. I go, that's great. But you know why? That, that shocker is, is something that's kind of an equalizer. Is it's 50,000 volts of electricity <laughs> that's going to immobilize the person that's the assailant, the attacker, right? Well, God is like 50 Googleplex of electricity, but he lives in you and me. We have all this authority. We have all this power. We have all this wisdom and understanding available to us, but we're not living according to what his word says about our situation. That's frustrating. And that's why you're frustrated because there's things that God has for you and it's telling you that he wants in your life, but you're not willing to set the time aside to shift in your mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, don't be conformed to the fashions and types of this world, but be transformed. Metamorphosis is where we get that word. It's metamorphic. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, a butterfly can never go back to being a caterpillar, correct? It never can go back to the chrysalis. It never can go back. And, you know, we see bugs life. I've talked about it before. And you're never like a beautiful little butterfly, right? The little tiny wings and the big fat caterpillar. That, that's not true. That doesn't even work. That doesn't exist. That wouldn't happen. See, when you're transformed, it's for good. You don't go back. You know, the, the, the caterpillar is like inching around on the ground, riding on his belly, eating all the low stuff. But then when it's transformed, this butterfly now becomes this beautiful, thin, long thing that's flying around in the high places, drinking from the nectar of life. And that's what the greatest picture for us to know who we are and what's available to us. And, and, and so God is, is all of this, all this for us and, and, and prepared and planned but we're not even really realizing what's available already on the inside of us, right? It's like God's literally saying, hey, hey, stop settling. Don't you know who you are? Like sometimes I, I, my dad mode takes over with my kids, and I'm like, I know who they are, but they don't know who they are yet. They have an idea. And they hear me talk, and they hear my wife talk about, hey, you guys can do it. You're confident. You're bold. You're tough. You're awesome. And they're like, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm amazing. I'm tough. I'm blah, blah, blah. And you know, you know it is. You know, you've been there before, you know, when you're a, a teenager or young adult. You're like, yeah, okay, right, right, right. And, but really, I see that in them because it's always been there. And there's greatness that's always been there on the inside of you that God wants you and needs you uh, to take ground for this time. And, 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 and so he's like waiting for you to be his voice in the earth. And so when you're not doing something, you're shutting the mouth of God in the earth. Well, I just I don't know. It's kind of hard. I'm just not really sure. How it, it's just really hard to do it. Get here. Uh, uh, no, you're more than this. You're better than this. That's what I'm saying to you, and that's what God's saying to you. You're made for greater. You're drawn out from God himself. Like my daughters that are in this room, if you sit us next to each other, you're going to find some likenesses of them and me, and me in them, because they're drawn out of me. But here's the thing. I didn't create her. See, what it was is God did. Your mom and your dad, they didn't create you. They were just your earth suit to get into this world. You are made and created from God. He's your father. He's the one that fashioned you and designed you for this. And he says, you're exactly what I need to get this out. And so when you're out and about, you're his voice in the earth. Say, I'm his voice. I don't know if I'm getting this across to you the right way I want it to, but when you get this, 
on the inside of you will make you so excited that you're not going to be able to withstand yourself. See, we don't blame people or situations because we already know we have all the authority, right? A lot of times we like to blame the devil for wrecking our life, don't we? I do. Oh, devil, get behind me, Satan. Wait a second. No, no, no. Let me tell you what wrecks your life. The seed that you allow in your life. What you allow in your life is what wrecks your life. Or builds your life. Or strengthens your life. Or blesses your life. So why don't we get the word in? So yesterday, you know, we were out and doing some things. And I was walking around and this homeless guy comes up. Starts talking to me. And, hey, man, can you, can you help my friend? You got a pair of shoes? You know, they just come up with a random like shoes what you don't okay yeah because it's a lead in it's always a lead in I was like man I'm sorry I can't help you I don't have any shoes sorry he's man if you had the shoes hurt my friend he's over there he's just messed up he's over there and the city took all my stuff and so I can't give him no shoes I just want to give him some shoes I go man I don't have anything I don't have any cash on me or anything I apologize I can't help you man and then uh so they were like well hey have you have you gone to John 3 16 over there have you tried out that one he goes yeah that place sucks I'm like oh so you've already got an answer to a solution, that, but you don't like the answer. And I was like, well, hey, you know, there's, there's uh, hope over here. And, and no, nah, man. And then I was like, hey, well, you know, right over here, there's, he goes, and I, I'm like, I can't think of the name of it. It's right over near the BOK. He goes, oh, Iron Gate? You're like, he already knew the name of it. I was like, yeah, Iron Gate. He goes, man, I, I can't really see without my glasses. I'm like, well, how did you make it over to me if you can't see your glasses, you know, you know. He always had an answer for something. And then he continues to talk, and he starts talking. He goes, I'm 53. I'm like, oh, crap, I'm 53. But he looks about 20 years older than me because I'm so good looking. No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. It's a joke. You're supposed to laugh. I was like, dang. And I was so thankful, though. I was like, thank you, God, for godly parents and for never giving up on me. When I didn't have anything to believe in, no one could believe in me, he did. And he chose me and he called me out to be his voice in the earth. And he's chosen you and called you out to be his voice in the earth. Because there's people that only you are going to be able to reach. Check this out. <clears throat> First Peter says this. I don't know if it's is it, is it going to be up there. It might be, it might not be. It says this. Yes, there it is. Thank you. It says, you are a chosen generation. It means he called you out. He pulled you out of himself for this time. Not only that, you're a royal priesthood. You're royalty. Say, I'm royalty. You're a holy nation. And this is something, uh, this next part here, it says you're a peculiar people. Now that means you're weird. And I'll be peculiar any day. I'll be weird any day. Because here's what society says normal is. Wear a mask, get a shot, and be sick all the time. Right? Here's another thing that's normal is rely on everyone and everything else to support you. Here's another thing that normal is. Hey, it's flu season. Get ready for the flu. No. I'd rather be peculiar. I'd rather be the weird one where it says, you know, what? by his stripes, I'm healed. And how about I don't get sick? Right? That's what it's saying right here. And so, so it's saying here, your royal, priest, uh, royal priesthood, holy nation, peculiar people, that you would show forth the praises of him. You're supposed to show forth his goodness. Your life is a reflection of his goodness. It says, what did he do? It says, show for the praise of him who did what? Called you out of darkness. That's awesome. He didn't just call you out. He put you in. Remember, God doesn't ever take you out of something if he doesn't have somewhere to put you into. He called you out of darkness to put you into his marvelous light. That's amazing. See, when you show forth the praises of him, you're doing his thing, not your own thing. So the day that God gave you a body, he was trying to speak something forth in the earth. How awesome is that? So some of you could be a, a, a logos or a word of love. Some of you could be a word of encouragement in the earth to someone else. Some of you could be uh, maybe a word of discipline in the earth. 
Some of you could be a, a word of passion in the earth or compassion in the earth. Some of you could be one of, of structure. God's got each and every one of us. But the moment that we're not doing what we're called to do, we're shutting his mouth in the earth. And that's why I think about this. And we think about there's all these different ministers, and you hear about these people like Smith the Wigglesworth, the Maria Woodworth Edder, and all that. And, and the, as they were hearing and talking to the Lord, you, you hear in their story, they say that the Lord told them that they weren't his first choice but like his seventh choice, her fifth choice. And you know why I think that is? I think it's because, I, actually I know it's because the previous choices did not fulfill the calling that was on their life. And God says in his word that he doesn't ever allow his word to return back to him void. But it always is going to accomplish what he sent it out to do. So why not let our lives be his word that's accomplished in the earth how exciting is that that now you go man i'm god's voice in the earth i'm god's sound in the earth i'm god's uh uh rhema in the earth some things that are second nature to you are totally foreign to someone else which would be a rhema all of a sudden it's an enlightened it's a spoken word from the word right so what is your life saying what is God saying through your life for this time see we're supposed to be a living epistle we're supposed to be the ones that are the testament in the earth we're the ones that are going to be taking ground right we're the ones that are going to show forth his praises in the earth well how do we do that by being his voice by getting our mind aligned and up to speed with what this says. And this word says, we even heard Darnell say it earlier, Malachi 3. You know, God says, hey, you've robbed me. And he goes, how have I robbed you? And he goes, in tithes and offerings. Well, we get our mind up, we start tithing, we start giving and offering. But then he goes on to say this, he goes, he goes your words have been stout against me. That means this, is that God can't do what he intended for your life to do because your words are stopping him short. See, we got to start changing our words. How do we change our words? By changing what we think. When we change what we think, it changes what we speak. And when we change what we speak, it changes what we do. When we change what we do, it changes our character. See, we're going to start telling God's vision and not somebody else's. Amen? Would you pray with me?